Welcome to PR Say. This is the podcast of the Houston chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. I'm your host, Veronica Sofer. So excited to be here with you. We uh, love PR Say because it gives us an opportunity to connect with all of our members. It really gives you an opportunity to learn a little bit about them so that when we do connect in person, you've got a name with a face. So I've got another great guest this week uh, who's going to be joining us. But before we get started, let's take care of some housekeeping. If you are listening on the podcast, Podcast, make sure you hit subscribe. We don't want you to miss any episodes of PR Say. And if you are watching on Facebook or on YouTube, drop some comments because my guests and I will definitely circle back and connect with you. So we'll go ahead and get started and bring on our outstanding guest. We have Mr. John Sweeney joining us. Hello, everyone. So glad you are joining us. You're joining us from Brookwood's group, John, and I'm so excited. I don't think we've had an opportunity to meet. So this is a great conversation. That I'm looking forward to. I'm happy to be here. I'm a longtime PRSA member, maybe longer than I care to admit. Ah, well, then you probably have some great stories to share later. We can talk offline. <laughs> Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what uh, got you to where you are right now in communications. Well, um, I, I've always inter been interested in communications. I have some natural communications ability. And in my earliest, earliest career, I was a, a radio news anchor. Then the mayor of the city I was living in asked me to be his press secretary. And I did that for a short time. Um, I managed to get out of political uh, public relations before the indictments were handed up, which was a good thing. Good for you. And, and uh, joined corporate PR. I worked for uh, General Electric for a while and then later IBM and for the longest time Compaq. So I was a corporate PR person writing newsletters and press releases and articles for the company magazines and executive speeches and doing all the great things that, that corporate public relations people do. Uh, also arguing with the press once in a while, but that part goes with the yeah. goes with the territory anyway, and um, uh, and I was at a PRSA luncheon back in uh, 1989. Living here in Houston, I was handling the I was the public information officer for the for Metro, what we call Metro, the Harris County Transit Authority, and uh, doing my good job to you know, talk up the uh, the transit authority at the time. I was at a PRSA lunch and a, and a young executive from Compaq was there at the table and we were just chatting and uh, and I said, well, gee, do you, know, do you hire former IBM people? Because I had been at IBM a very, very short time. And uh, he said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll hire any crazy person. Well, that was the key word. Uh, and within two weeks, I found myself at, at Compaq uh, fairly early on in, in the and the company was all less than 10 years old at the time. And uh, uh, and I stayed there for about the next decade until one of the co-founders of Compaq, a guy named Rod Canyon, asked me and a handful of other people to go off and play dot com with him. And that's exactly what we did until the dot com bubble burst. And uh, I found myself not working, but. Luckily, people who I knew hired me on to do marketing, communications, public relations, contracting. Uh, I was working uh, under contract full time for Shell. And while I was at Shell, somebody called me up and said, hey, I need you over for a full time job uh, over at the, what was Compaq still. And I said, well, I'm really busy myself, but I can get somebody I know to do that uh, and I'll be responsible for it, but I won't be doing the work. And they said, fine, that's what we need. So I called up somebody I knew, I knew what I could pay. I had them uh, doing that project. Somebody else from Compaq called up a couple of weeks later and said, hey, I need you to clone the person you sent here a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> have them here. And by then I knew the right answer. I'd said, oh, well, sure, no problem, not no problem at all. I hung up the phone, I thought, okay, now what do I do? Well, I figured it out and hired somebody who also I trusted. And before long, I had four employees uh, who were working for me doing contract work at various companies. Mm -hmm. And I was still doing my full-time contract work. And uh, uh, so what I had created without really intending to was a staffing firm. Yeah. And um, so we've been doing that now for, for about 24 years. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love you. It's almost like you fell into your business a, li oh, a little bit. Totally fell into it. You just, you know, it's like what it's like well, I did what I now preach to others to do, which is understand what your natural talents are, 
leverage those natural talents and almost everything else will fall into place somehow or another. Um, it's, uh, we encourage uh, younger professionals and even seasoned professionals to uh, do a test online uh, and a book called Strengths Finder. You can find mm -hmm. it on Amazon, Strengths Finder. Do the test. It, it identifies your top five natural talents mm -hmm. from a profile of 34 natural talents that humans tend to have. And those are talents that are hardwired into you. You, so you either use them or you don't use them. You can't gain any more talents. You can't get rid of them. You can either use them or not. So the beauty that we uh, that we talk about is, you know, use them. Know what they are first. And second of all, actually use them in your career and in your personal life to decide how you spend your valuable time. Yeah, that's really great advice. And and I've actually done that um, assessment before, and it's very helpful. And um, and I it's think shockingly it's on target, for, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And it's interesting if you do it in one part in your career and then fast forward and do it again, maybe a decade or so later. And it's interesting to see how there have been a little bit of tweaking, if you will, or a little bit of movement. Um, I mean, at your core, you're who you are, but sometimes it, it shifts a little bit. So that's really good advice. So give it, give us some other golden uh, nuggets of wisdom. What would you tell some of our younger PRSA members who are joining and attending some of our events? Well, I, I mean, what, what I already relayed is that, Participating in PRSA makes a huge difference at any stage in your career, whether you're in a in, in a, you know an old fogey like me who is uh, often looking for new professionals to help fill some sort of need that I have or my clients have, or whether you're younger and start trying to figure out exactly what you should do and where you should do it. Um, it it sounds like such a cliche, but keep doing something. Yeah. Uh, you, you know we all have. Uh, colleagues in public in PRSA and public relations in general who practice this mantra of actually going out and doing things. They volunteer with stuff. They, oh, I don't know, do a podcast in their spare time. They, you know, keep busy um, advancing the profession, advancing themselves and building relationships that are genuine. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, networking is not just showing up somewhere and holding out your business, handing out your business card. That's right. Uh, networking is showing up somewhere, you know, engaging in a genuine conversation with somebody about what's on their mind, what's important to them, what they need in their careers and in their lives, how what what you may need. And if there's some, you know, genuine dialogue, hell, or communicators, we should know how to carry on genuine dialogue and do a real conversation about what's going on. And, and that's what I encourage people to do. Get out there and join, not necessarily only PRSA. If you're a communicator, there's also what used to be called BMA, uh, the IABC, mm -hmm. um, and professional associations in your industry, yeah. the staffing association or the pipeline association. There are all these groups that that are of interest to join. Mm -hmm. and as long as you have some valid reason, join them and yeah. participate. No, that's great advice. And it's so true. And it's so interesting to see um, where people can connect the dots because you might know someone in one space and may not necessarily need anything from them or they need something from you in that moment. But a year or two later, you go, oh, I remember, John, we were talking about that. And so let me let me refer him to someone else. And when you bring value to folks, that's absolutely the best way to make a connection. Mm -hmm. Sure is. Yeah, sure no, is. I think that's really good and, advice. And, and you don't have to... Uh, you don't have to make up something that's that's um, that's not genuine um, right. in order to uh, you know pretend to be adding value where you really can't. Yeah, um, there are things that that everyone listening to this podcast does really really well. In fact, we're back going back to what we mentioned a minute ago, leveraging their natural talents. Mm -hmm. So there are things that they can do that leverage their natural talents that really allow them to add value to their community, to their profession, to their families, to their um, uh, affinity groups. That's mm -hmm. my broad term for, you know, your churches, your car clubs, sure. your neighborhood associations, anything where you have something in common, you can add huge value to those as a, as a communications professional. Um, uh, what I found is, is that if you get involved in any kind of affinity group, as soon as 
other members of the leadership of the group find that you can put two synapses together and communicate yeah. <laughs> something clearly, they're going to want you as president. Yeah, like, it's like true. That. It's, it's, it's true. It's so true. I'm guilty. I mean, once the uh, former cookie mom, I was in Girl Scouts as a Girl Scout mom, once the former cookie mom figured out what I did for a living, she was like, Oh, I've got a job for you next year. And I had cookies in my house for weeks on end every year. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a flip side to that coin because, you know, communications folks really are blessed with, uh, most of us have a natural ability to communicate, mm -hmm. which also gives us a natural ability to, to a certain degree, lead teams, groups, or, or organizations as well. Um, because we can be so clear in what we see as the, uh, the goal, the outcome, and the steps to get there. And mm -hmm. that, that comes natural to us. So the flip side of that coin includes a, um, a little, uh, uh, my cousin replaced his driver's license in his wallet that window took out his driver's license and put in a little three by a little two by three card. And the two by three card said where he would see it every day. If you can't say no and mean it, then you can never say yes and sustain it. Wow. And what he was reminding himself of is that he, his time and your time and my time and anybody who's has the, the, the motivation to listen to this broad, uh, podcast, mm -hmm. You, our time is valuable and we're in demand and you have to say no to almost more, most of the things that come your way, yeah. because uh, that way, when you do say yes, people know you actually have the bandwidth right. and the ability to follow through on it. There's nothing worse than taking on too much stuff because you're asked. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there was a time decades ago when I was, you know, involved in a half a dozen boards of directors, a president of at least two of them. And there were my evenings gone, my weekends gone. I had a business to run. I had yeah. a dog that needed me. I had a family that needed me. Um, you know, the, and, and other things that I enjoyed doing that I didn't have time to do. So I had to actually learn to say no in a nice way. And, um, and then for the things that I did say yes to, I could really follow through on them. That's yeah. a lesson that it takes a long time to learn sometimes. Yeah. And some of us have to learn it the hard way. Cause as you were talking, yeah. I was, I felt my, you know, some, some reaction to what you yeah, were the saying. The hair on the back you of your home. neck was going up. Yeah. Yeah. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit, but it, that's really great advice. That's fantastic advice. So John, um, now that we've had a chance to get to know you a little bit better, how can folks connect with you? What's the best way to uh, learn more about you and connect and stay in touch? Right. Well, the, you know, the, the beauty of doing what I do is that the, the best way for folks to connect with me is through my company, because oh. I have a secret confession to make, you know, my secret of running a good business is to hire great people, give them clear, uh, uh, clear goals and the tools that they need to meet those goals and then stay out of their way. There you go. <laughs> the last thing is the hardest part. It's hard to stay out of the way, but I do my best. And the people who are really uh, uh, great to know in my company, it isn't me because I'm not the one who is matching candidates to great jobs. We have great clients who have great opportunities and we have great candidates that we've gotten to know over the last decades. And some folks are folks that we just come to know. And folks on my team are the ones who are doing that matchmaking. Um, I, I either joke that depending on your, your own history and background, my folks are either Yentas or Yodas. Mm. Um, it's one or the other. It's we're the matchmakers that that sort of put it together. But it's but but that doesn't go through my muddled brain. It goes through the great folks on my team who actually argue over who's the best fit. Should we submit this candidate or these candidates to our client? What kind of personality is our client? And is that somebody, or do we have people who will actually fit well into that work group? So all that debate goes on. Uh, so it's important for PRSA members to know what Brookwoods group is, to roll over to brookwoods.com mm -hmm. at some point, uh, subscribe to our uh, a newsletter that on a daily basis, any new job posting 
is, and the, all of our postings are real, any new job posting goes out overnight to everyone on the list. So that at least you know what it is. And I don't expect um, people, everybody in town to subscribe to our list because they're looking for work. Most of our subscribers, most of the people who get our newsletters overnight, um, just want to know what we've posted because they may know somebody who right. would be great for that job. And half of them are still marketing and communications positions. Our clients have demanded that we take on other types of professional roles, engineering types and um, you know, accounting types and, and other things. But it's really only because they like our technique and they want us to apply it to other professions. Mm -hmm. The bulk of our business is still PR and marketing and communications folks. That's great. Well, John, we will definitely include the uh, website and contact information in the show notes. It was so great to have you on the show. Happy to be here. Have good luck to everyone and keep moving forward. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, John. We will make sure that uh, we include all that information. So be sure to follow, connect. PRSA is a fantastic way for you to network, grow your reach, and really tap into some fantastic leaders and experts in our space. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed connecting with John Sweeney. If you are listening on the podcast, hit subscribe. We don't want you to miss any episodes. And if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, drop us some comments and John and I will follow up and connect with you. Thanks so much. See you next time.